basically, I was introduced to this project by um, my good friend, uh, production designer John Beard, and he introduced me to uh, Ian Softly, the director, and um, I got really excited about the project. I really, you know, they, they gave me a script to read, and this is the script actually, um, and it was uh, it was pretty inspiring. So I really, you know, decided that I really wanted to do it, but I needed to kind of capture the essence of the street and what was going on and so I was sent to New York and um, it was really fortunate when I when I arrived in New York because there was this crazy um, Wigstock drag festival on on one of the piers and um, so we went on this kind of massive uh, research trip and I took loads and loads of photos there was like RuPaul was performing and Debbie Harry and Lady Bunny it was absolutely amazing, and some of the outfits we saw there were just incredible. And so I used some of those images in my mood boards. So these boards were, were really um, uh, integral in trying to convey that message over. And then I started to create worlds within the mood boards. So this is like weird world, for example, and this was more extreme world. And... And then you've got like normal world here. And um, so basically I was trying to uh, fuse all this together to, to give the characters an, a, an individual look. Okay, let's start with the characters. Uh, obviously the main male character is, is Johnny Lee Miller, um, um, whose character is Dade. And I kind of saw him as the sort of quiet nerdy, bit geeky, sort of understated character in, in sort of utilitarian clothes, but still with a bit of an edge to him. And um, he mostly wears this uh, biker jacket, this cafe racer jacket from the 70s that I found on Portobello Road. And then I got this idea of, um, I wanted him to be kind of like tied up somehow. So I found this uh, horse bridle and um, made it like a sort of uh, a contraption that, that, that held him together around his legs. Um, and that was his main sort of look. I just said, quite understated and a bit nerdy and a bit utility looking. Um, so that was, his, that was his main look. So here's, here's another classic Johnny outfit. Um, Military. We, we really like putting him in military stuff, um, but in this particular instance, another, another little gilet that we dyed purple, um, just to give it a, another bit of an edge. And he's got his, he's got his uh, skater's um, uh, keychain and military pants again, and, and his work boots, his military boots. Um, this, was the, this was the utility Johnny that was sort of throughout the movie. Johnny, again, uh, this was probably one of his most adventurous outfits. I found this quite interesting sailing um, um, gilet, um, like fluorescent colour that I wanted him to wear. And um, I also put him in this um, quicksilver top, which has got a barbed wire print on it, which I thought was a you know, a bit radical at the time. Although it dated from the 90s, it, it, was, it was kind of um, referencing punk again. And coming, coming back to punk, he's, he's got a pair of bondage trousers on there uh, designed by um, Vivian Westwood from her, um, the Clint Eastwood collection. And he, he wears the classic rollerblades. We decided to put him in red laces. Just so this was this was his party outfit, and he he, he was at his most colourful, I think, here. So in the last scene in the movie, the famous swimming pool scene and the kiss and so on, we wanted to put them in something a little different, a bit more sort of designed. And um, I designed this sort of like a frock coat, but with sort of Japanese-inspired sleeves. And he's also got uh, Vivian Westwood um, original 70s oilskin bondage trousers and Westwood boots, actually, from the 1970s. Angelina was... Um, I really, really wanted to get some John Galliano into this, into this movie. Uh, and he'd just, he'd just come out with a Japanese collection 
uh, for Dior, I think it was, and it was just so inspiring. But of course, we couldn't afford John Galliano prices. So we decided to create our own, and I designed this little um, mini kimono for her with, a, with, a, with an OB. But, you know, worn with stockings and, and the old combat boots. And um, it, it still had the kind of element of uh, toughness about her, but a little bit more feminine that we really liked. And she carried it off really well. So while I was in New York, I was asked by production to go meet uh, Angelina, who was kind of reticent about doing this movie um, for some reason. And she was a bit standoffish um, um, to start with. But after a while, I, you know, I showed her some of my mood boards and, you know, talked about, the, about how I'd been inspired by these kids and so on. And she eventually she kind of came around and she's like, she got it. She was, she was, um, she felt like she got a grip on it and, and she, she kind of wanted to be involved. And, and I mean, in actual fact, it was the biggest one of the biggest shocks to all of us when she did, agreed to have a haircut. I mean, because, you know, here she is with this, like, really long hair and she's been modelling. And, and we actually persuaded her to have her this, like, little 50s-style pixie cut, and, which really suited her, actually. And, um, but she really got into the part, and um, we, had, we had so much fun uh, 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 fitting her and uh, her and Johnny. We put them in so many different outfits, I mean, particularly her, and here's all the Polaroids from the shoot. We had too many outfits to, to, um, to choose from in the end, and we had to kind of edit some out, and so some of them you'll, you'll see in here just didn't, never actually made the, made the movie. But it was... Um, that's all part of the process. So Angelina, I wanted her to be like a, an androgynous tomboy and kind of, you know, tough but chic. And, and so she had a lot of changes. This was her main outfit, the classic Suzuki biker jacket from the 70s, riding um, jodhpurs and her um, oxygen uh, uh, rollerblades. And oh, and the quicksilver top. I found this really weird um, uh, backpack that she wears, which is like um, some army flare backpack or something. You put flares into it. So this outfit here for Angelina is, um, is an original 1970s kind of punk bondage suit. It wasn't a, a current thing you could buy in a shop, but it was, it was a young uh, creative designer that, that made it for herself. And... Um, I acquired it sometime in the in the seventies, and anyway, it fit Angelina like a, a glove, and she actually, I think it was one of her favourite outfits. So one of the outfits I get asked a lot about is this is, is this particular one here that Angelina wore. And the origins actually, and actually, it's a combination of two things. It, it's a fencing top um, and pants, and um, uh, ice hockey pads, which look really interesting together, but uh, uh, totally out of context. So he, here's another a classic Angelina outfit, um, this red uh, parachute top, which uh, is a, a copy of a Westwood one from the 70s. It was done in, it was made in the 70s by one of the many companies that were copying their designs. And um, she wore it quite a lot in the movie. She looked really good in it, we felt. Um, a lot of my references came from the 70s for some reason. One of the most popular outfits I get asked a lot about is this, is this uh, outfit here. It's a New York Devils um, hockey uh, shirt. And um, it, again, I, you know, it was using sportswear and taking it out of context. So another popular Kate outfit um, was, was this one here, or this jacket. I mean, she. Essentially, she wears those same uh, riding jumpers throughout. But this um, this jacket here is a gold denim Westwood uh, jacket from the 90s uh, that we found. That again, really, really suited her. But a lot of people ask me, how do we decide on what the cast are going to wear at any given time? Or And that's kind of more or less dictated to by the script. Because the script initially is broken down into days, 
And so you will have a different change for each day. And sometimes there might be a, a morning scene or an evening scene or a going out scene or something where they might change yet again. It's uh, quite a process doing, and we have to do all these breakdowns before, um, uh, before we start actually shooting so that we know who's going to wear what on what day. And then, of course, you know, movies are never shot in sequence. They're always shot out of, out of time. So it's important to keep accurate records and Polaroids and stuff of, 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 how, uh, of who wore what on what day and how they wore it. Um, so, that, so there is an element of continuity running through the whole thing. Um, and so um, usually, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's like, you know, the first day that a character is being seen in a new outfit, I'll, I'll be called onto set. And um, as soon as that's been filmed, then that is established, then that, that becomes uh, that, a part of their wardrobe. That I can then walk away uh, and go get onto the next person. And so a lot of my role is... Um, uh, it, it, it's not done on on the set at all, really. I mean, it's it, it you know I, I would probably spend half an hour or an hour a day on on the set, and the rest of the time I'm out preparing outfits for the next scenes that are coming along the following day or even a week in advance, um, because you know you, you, you're working it's you're working on a treadmill all, all the time. This this. Filming can't stop. It has to, you know, it's it's building up and up and up, and um, you have to keep feeding this hungry beast. So he he we got the character Freak, who's played by uh, Renoli Santiago, and I kind of saw him as the Salvador Dali of the pack. And here's some of the Polaroids from his outfits, and you'll see on this Polaroid, you know, scene one five two one five three Freak. You know these 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 Polaroids become like a, a put in a, in a Bible for the wardrobe staff to uh, keep an ap accurate record of um, you know how the th how these outfits are going to be seen. Here's some more of his stuff up here. This tartan uh, jacket's one of his, and again a leopard print un underneath. And this um, we were really pleased with this T-shirt here. Unfortunately, it doesn't light up anymore, but we found it on Times Square. It's just like a, you know, it was in like a real trashy tourist shop, but it's got this pink kitten on it with with lighting up eyes. <laughs> Renoli was just like, like so into it. It was just so great. He, he loved that outfit. One of the oddballs in the pack is uh, Joey, played by Jesse Bradford. And Joey's like a space cadet. Uh, well, to me, he was like a space cadet, and he was trying sort of really hard to be cool and into death metal bands, but but he's probably still dressed by his mum. You know, he wears like Carhartt dungarees and Dr. Martins and stuff, and he's, he's pretty kind of safe. And um, I remember, I remember um, um, uh, watching him smoke. It was just like, he was like, he was like he, he was, you know, smoking like a 12-year-old or something. It was really funny on, on the set. So as I said, Joey was like this lost in space character in my in my view, and so we found this great T-shirt that the Martians are coming to save the Earth, and teamed it up with these uh, flame pants with little devils on, little skateboarding pants, and here he is here. We actually found a lost in space um, uh, cap that he 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 wore um, pretty much throughout the whole movie with his uh, Lone Star Texas uh, shirt on and like regular chinos and, you know, day glow trainers. I mean, like I said, you know, he's dressed by his mum, this guy. And he's got, he's got this wonderful um, Keith Haring uh, uh, smiley face um, um, backpack. So Serial, he was the most fun to dress in, in a funny sort of way because he felt like he'd get away with wearing anything. And um, he mostly wears biker trousers and biker boots and but he's got all these attachments hanging off him and stuff and he rattles about and stuff to me i mean he's a, he was he's a real street urchin and, and you know constantly jabbering away and and like a magpie he's like you know gathering ornamentation as he skates along around the streets of new york he primarily wears this american um, 
Air Force flying suit, but he wears it like a coat. It's a very unusual item, actually. Um, but we decorated this coat with uh, images from different films and stuff. He, was, he uses it like a canvas to, to, to display um, images of his anti-heroes like Charles Manson and Dennis Hopper in blue velvet and stuff. Serial's the kind of guy that wears his heart on his sleeve and, he, and he's probably the closest thing to uh, um, an authentic New York street punk. This top that he's got on here, this Lou Reed uh, um, Transformer uh, tank top, we bought, bought it in a, in, a, in, a, in a vintage store in, in Manhattan, but it was only a few years ago um, when I found out that, um, I found out its, its origins. And evidently, Lou was in, in Australia and doing a press conference. And, you know, Lou's a bit testy with the, with the, uh, with the press out there. But he, and he, evidently, he spotted this woman in the audience wearing this, um, wearing this tank top. And he called her, you know, down to the down to the stage, and um, she thought she was going to be sued because he was, because he's he's very hot on copyright infringement and so on. But instead, he actually ordered um, um, her to make uh, one for every member of the band and and for the crew. So. Um, <laughs> How this ended up in New York, back in New York, you know, some, I don't know, 15, 20 years later, I, I don't know. Um, it, uh, who knows who it could have belonged to? Uh, could have even been Lou's own. Nikon, played by Lawrence Mason. You know, Nikon was a, 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 a real dark horse, truly kind of streetwise character. And, the very essence of cool, and and here he's got on a, an apre ski jacket and a '60s Dolly Bird photo print T-shirt, and and his vinyl pants and um, oxygen rollerblades. The first time we're kind of introduced to Nikon is when uh, all the gang go around to his his apartment, and he appears wearing this military. Um, a cape with a, with a hood up over, over his face, and he's like really, uh, uh, really sinister, and really quite something. But it was a, it was a really good find this cape, um, and, and it was actually it you you it looks like a military cape, but it's not a military cape. It was designed by a French designer called Jean de, Cas de Castelbergiac, um, and sometime in the eighties. So um, there was these two uh, characters in the movie called Razor and Blade, who sadly we didn't see that much of. But um, it, it's such a shame because we really kind of went to town on them. And um, Razor, played by Dar uh, Darren Lee, he's um, in, this, in this particular uh, outfit, he's got this kind of pirate surf jacket and velvet pants and these Yeti boots. Uh, and this... This little bit of fur he's got around his neck. In, interesting. We went on a we went on a recce to um, a Coney Island one day, and found this old sort of uh, junk shop in an art in, in in an archway, and it was a, full of the most absolute crap you could ever imagine. But the guy had all this like um, pastel coloured offcuts of fur, and I ended up buying a sack of it and trimming out some of the you know costumes for for the movie and here we are again with razor and blade and this time blade has got like stripes um candy colored top bleach striped pants two-tone shoes and this patchwork um denim jacket uh this was actually uh, made by um designer friend of mine called uh, Dean Bright who was living in New York at the time and actually he became an assistant on on the film and uh, and helped us find a lot of the stuff in New York. Dean was um, a peer of John Galliano. They were all at St Martin's at the same time. You know Galliano stole, stole all the limelight but Dean was was right up there um, for, for a while. This outfit here uh, is a uh, um, uh, uh, one of Razor's outfit, as, uh, and um, it's a Westwood, what's called an armor jacket, and it was kind of based on a, um, like, you know, medieval knight's armor uh, with movable kind of p 
pieces on it, but also had a, a sort of American football sort of feel to it. And, and he, we he wears that with like black palazzo pants and uh, monkey boots. So here we've got the three um, real baddies, the Ellingson Mineral Corporation baddies um, who are trying to mess up everything. We've got Margot, played by Lorraine Bracco. I mean, amazing, what a, what a character. She's one dangerous lady and always, always in like high heels and stuff. But we, this is a, a, a sparkly tweed suit we put her in, but she also wears tarty furs and a 70s leather trench coat. Penn Gillette. Wow, he was uh, a, a bit of a handful, this character. Um, uh, thankfully, only he, a big guy. Um, <laughs> thankfully, um, he just gets to wear a, a blue, blue boiler suit throughout. Um, but he, yeah, he was, he was, he was quite, quite a character, that one, to deal with. And then lovely Fisher Stevens, um, who plays the plague. He was a joy to dress. I kind of based him on a, like a sort of 18th or well, 19th century dandy and put him in lots of different brocade waistcoats and morning trousers and this iconic fur coat that he wears um, throughout. And it, you, you see him kind of on his skateboard wearing this fur coat. He's, he's great character, really, really good. Really liked him a lot. So... When we first set out on this um, uh, this venture with this movie, I mean, I thought, you know, it's going to be quite um, uh, quite a journey. And um, even though it was it was um, uh, financed by Warner Brothers, uh, they 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 were a bit mean. They didn't want to spend a lot of money on this film, and that was another reason that we um, couldn't really get heavily costuming, uh, you know, making stuff in, 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 in it. So we had to be pretty inventive. And um, so the budget was, I can't even remember what the budget was, but it, we, we, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a great deal as far as feature films are concerned. So I, having a, um, a large collection of, of, um, of street fashion myself that I've collected since the 60s, I came to a deal with them whereby um, if there was going to be any um, uh, purchases or makes, then I would end up keeping um, the, the, uh, the purchases and makes after the film. That is the reason why we have everything here today, because uh, I was lucky enough to um, hang on to it. This is not normally the case. You know, normally a production company if they've spent a lot of money on, on, the, on, the, on the costume, then they want to hang on to it. Um, or, or it kind of disappears, or who knows. You know, people just think they can just take it away or whatever. But um, I'm lucky enough in, in having uh, pretty much every, everything that was uh, uh, worn by the main cast for this movie. So... Um, that's the end of our little tour. I, I really hope you've enjoyed it. And if uh, you've got any questions, please email. But if you're interested in um, what we're doing here, please have a look at our website at the, thehorsehospital.com. Thank you. <laughs>